right. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, and thank you all uh, for this opportunity to, to join you today. Um, so as, as Joan introduced, I'm Jay Bordur, uh, Associate Director of Digital Scholarship Infrastructure and Services in the McMaster University Library, and also the Admin Director of the Lewis and Ruth Sherman Center for Digital Scholarship. So it's my pleasure today to, to take part in these activities and talk about some of my experiences building a comprehensive digital research support in a research intensive university and reflect on the role that our digital scholarship center and the library has played uh, in this important work. Uh, and before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land from which I present today and the peoples who have long lived in balance with it. So I joined today from McMaster University in, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, also known traditionally as Ahrun Wakun, which is within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Anishinaabe nations to ensure that those who live here take only what they need, leave enough in the dish for others and keep the dish clean. Um, I would also note that this agreement precedes settlers, so I can't assume that I can take part in the resources being shared, but it's always an important practice to abide by the existing treaty and wampum responsibilities in the place you live. So today, in today's presentation, I'd like to tell the story of two initiatives that I've been uh, fortunate to participate in and are near and dear to my heart. Um, one of them is the Lewis and Ruth Sherman Center for Digital Scholarship, uh, which is a joint venture between the University Library and the Faculty of Humanities that's been raising the profile of digital scholarship. Uh, and I love the definition that Jones provided earlier um, and meeting researchers needs over the, the past 10 years. The other is a, a fledgling initiative here, uh, which it, uh, the library is involved with called the Digital Research Commons Pilot or DRCP, uh, which aims to build a more connected and coordinated approach to digital research support uh, broadly across campus. Um, both have a research support mandate, mandate, but as I'll discuss over the slides to follow, um, each is approaching the challenge from a different entry point and scale. So if you haven't guessed already from the title of my talk, I'll, I'll be using the wheel uh, as a metaphor while I introduce and draw co common themes between the two initiatives. Um, I particularly love this metaphor for the work that we're doing because for a wheel to get you to its destination, all of its pieces need to be tightly coordinated. Even if they're doing slightly different things or serving different purposes. And some of the interesting that things that happen when you strain this metaphor to large complex and dynamic higher education institutions, um, some of the things that happen is you start asking yourself questions like um, which which part of the wheel are we actually building um, how do we put this together while well, the horses are already running out of the stable um, how many wheels does this thing actually have uh, and, and many more so before i get into some of those deep existential questions that probably no one is asking um, i would like to give you a brief introduction to the, the sherman center and the digital research commons pilot I'll describe their work a little bit and then reflect about how the successes and challenges of the former um, has really guided the, the direction of the latter. So to give you a, a quick overview of McMaster University, so it's a relatively large research intensive university in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Um, it's home to about 33,000 students. It has six faculties or, or colleges and a medical school. Um, and as we like to tout uh, when speaking of ourselves, McMaster is highly decentralized uh, with both central and faculty based research and IT support units. So it's a, it's a complex environment to, uh, to provide support and to get support as well. Um, the Sherman Center itself is, a, is an official McMaster Research Center. It's located physically within Mills Memorial Library here at McMaster. It was established in 2012 uh, through a collaboration between the Library and Faculty of Humanities um, with a, a, a gift from the Lewis and Ruth Sherman Foundation. Um, the Sherman Center's mission and audience has, has always been defined broadly beyond the Faculty of Humanities. Our, our founding document describes it as a, a campus-wide resource that fosters library faculty collaboration in an inter in interdisciplinary digital research and scholarship. Um, and so we, we do this by providing infrastructure expertise and opportunities for collaboration. Um, and the idea uh, and vision is still very relevant to, to what we do today. Uh, and it's even its high level objectives have remained relatively the same and, and to, to state all this really succinctly, uh, we try to support all forms of digital scholarship we uh, engage with and bring together communities through our programming, we promote resource sharing through collaboration and we maintain platforms for open scholarship digital preservation and knowledge dissemination. Uh, and we do all of that through no feat of magic, but through the hard and, and groundbreaking work of uh, all of our Sherman Center staff as well. Um, and the colleagues with which they work closely uh, beyond the library. Um, 
but we always weren't such a large group. Much of this, much of the existence of Sherman Center, it was about three or four FTEs uh, that were dedicated to at any single time. Um, and there weren't really significant champions across campus either. Uh, so in that way, it was, it was a hub that needed spokes. Um, we achieved this over time through a commitment to engagement and growing the community. Much of our work focused on training and programming to get people in the space, introduce them to the tools and approaches they never knew they needed, um, and then introduce them to the people who could help train and support them. And through this work, we've built a, a rather large community of scholars across campus and beyond campus as well. Um, in partnerships with research centers and institutes uh, beyond the Sherman Center, with IT and research support units, both central and within the faculties as well. Um, towards the end of 2018, we really reached a point where continued growth was impossible without more people to sustain it. We needed more expertise in emerging areas like data analysis and visualization, research data management, research impact, um, but also more attention to coordination and communication. Uh, the spokes were being built, but needed to be tied into the hub and into the rest of the wheel uh, for it to be successful. Um, I think as others have, have mentioned before, we, we we invested so much time into the doing that we didn't spend enough time with the telling as well. And so we needed a lot of support with communication too. Um, with thanks to the University Library for its support in this area, we were able uh, to expand the center over the next couple of years by reorganizing units, bringing in new positions to support um, those areas of need uh, and to bring in a dedicated coordinator and communicator. We also partnered with our Office of Research and its High Performance Computing Unit to bring aboard two research data management specialists to, to meet the growing needs for research data management support and strategy on campus. Uh, and it was through a lot of the emerging research data management work that the Sherman Center's efforts um, informed the emergence of the Digital Research Commons pilot. So four of the members of the Sherman Center team were part of McMaster's Research Data Management Institutional Strategy, strategy Working Group, um, which developed in response to um, a policy requirement from the Canadian federal agency uh, agencies that provide funding known as the Tri-Agency. So this work involved collaboration with a, a broad set of campus research stakeholders, including researchers, faculty leadership, and, and many other administrators and support units as well. Um, and while the, the strategy development, I'd say, was a resounding success, and we've had, uh, we have an excellent guiding document, um, our engagements also resurfaced and confirmed uh, the longstanding challenges of digital research support at McMaster and, and probably many other places as well. Um, while its decentralization yields benefits in terms of flexibility and agility for research support, it leads to uneven service delivery, um, lots of inequities in terms of what's available to researchers across faculties and roles, uh, and it ends up with the all too common researcher refrain, I just don't know what's available, I don't know where to look for it, and I just don't have the time to figure it all out. And, and this statement and sentiment um, is pervasive through all of our work, as well as all the preceding reviews of research in central IT that have been done over the past decade as well. Um, and it highlights the frustrations, um, uh, that the frustrations are less about whether a service or resource exists, but rather the delivery and communication um, needing improvement. Um, it's a coordination issue much more than it is a, a capacity issue in many senses. And so in response to this need and many others, uh, the Digital Research Commons pilot was imagined and funded as a three-year uh, project in 2022. So the initiative is, is co-sponsored and co-led by the Office of the VP Research, the University Library, and the Office of the AVP uh, and Chief Technology Officer, uh, with the recognition that only by working in these shared spaces are we going to be able to meet the diverse and nuanced needs um, of researchers across McMaster. Um, the vision of the DRCP is to build a more connected, capable, and researcher-focused approach to digital research support that will improve access to systems, services, software, and training for researchers across the institution. And, and in simplified terms, um, we see our role as helping researchers who may take many different roles, easily access whatever it is that they need for their research, whether that's offered locally within McMaster or broadly by provincial or national providers. Um, at the same time, it would be really nice if, the, if the, um, the needs of the researchers are clear and apparent to service providers so they can work together to meet those collective needs, reduce redundancies, identify gaps, and, and collaborate on solutions that will fill them. The key text that I've highlighted here is the build into and around, which I, I think truly encapsulates the spirit of the work. Um, to use a, a different and slightly grosser analogy, we often refer to the DRCP as the connective tissue uh, between researchers and the research support units who uh, support their work. 
And the team itself consists of sub teams that join this initiative from their homes in three sponsoring units. Uh, the sub teams provide their normal services and collaborate on projects that span across them, building better support resources for researchers, while also building relationships and understanding between them as well. Uh, the assessment team helps us understand needs and services and the core team keeps us organized and connected to the many other supporting units on campus to which we are building connections. And so revisiting the wheel metaphor, it, it's safe to say that the DRCP serves much more as the spokes than it does the hub, but there are also many different hubs across campus, each serving an important and distinct role on campus. And, and so there is no singular hub. So, um, you know, to extend this metaphor even further, maybe it's best to think of the DRCP as, a, as a, the axles and chassis trying to tie together the wheels, ensuring that everything's moving in one direction in unison and pieces aren't, aren't flying off to the wayside. Um, and to be honest, that sounds about right with the, our early experiences with this. There are many, many wheels and the, the load is significant and the course change takes a lot of time and effort. And so maybe, maybe it's more akin to thinking of it as an 18 wheeler uh, that we're trying to, to guide and maintain here. And so that, that might ultimately be what the, the DRCP is. So I, I think my time is almost up, but I wanted to try to tie this all together uh, by sharing a few parting thoughts and highlighting the common elements of these two initiatives and discuss how the work of the Sherman Center has informed and, and really led to um, uh, how we imagined and a lot of what we've done within the DRCP. Uh, and, and since I'll be speaking more organizationally focused aspects, um, I'd like to highlight that neither of these would be possible without the highly skilled and knowledgeable people uh, that contribute to them and, and offer those services that researchers need. Um, so the first is Capacity is great. And once you have capacity, um, it's really clear that coordination and communication are absolutely critical. And so in the case of the Sherman Center, as I've mentioned, we hit a point where progress wasn't going to scale anymore as we added more people until that coordinating layer was created. Uh, and as the number of um, involved stakeholders increased, uh, so does the challenge with delivering the message to many audiences as well. And so we recognize in the Sherman Center uh, roughly around that time too, that um, that we needed more help in that area, and we've been very fortunate uh, to that our digital scholarship coordinator that we've brought into this role has that skill set, and they've been able to work with um, broader communications as well within the library and beyond campus because it it really takes a whole team to to do this well. Um, and we've taken this to heart within the DRCP and we're employing a communication specialist right from the outset uh, to help us build and implement a proper strategy, um, being mindful that we don't want to figure this out as we're, as we're going through it, that we'd like to have a solid strategy for communicating and collaborating with campus leadership, uh, various supporting units um, and researchers across all faculties. Um, second is, is that actually facilitating community and collaboration takes a, a whole lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of intentionality. Um, from our experience, it's pretty easy to bring together a group of people for a discussion. What's uh, much harder and more challenging is to um, is developing true interdisciplinary collaboration where people understand each other, where they can embody common values and, and can work together with a shared set of goals. And for the DRCP to succeed, this is really the type of transformational collaboration uh, that we need between the subteams and with the other groups across campus with which they uh, they collaborate. So. Um, what we've learned and demonstrated in the Sherman Center through its development uh, is that making progress in this area can't be rushed and, and nor can it be prescribed, whether bringing people together into community or initiating a cross unit project. Um, you know, people need time and they need space to share ideas and develop trust and respect with each other. Um, we've tried to make the, the Sherman Center that kind of space and we're infusing these principles into the, the DRCP as we move forward with it. Uh, and finally, uh, keeping it research centric as much as possible. And so at the end of the day, um, it's, it's all about research. And, and from the Sherman Center side, we've invested many years into building that community so we could understand needs uh, and develop programming and services uh, that meet them, um, recognizing that this was necessary to our vision. Um, within the DRCP, uh, we're trying to bake this right into the very fabric of the initiative. And in many cases, it's, it's about meeting the researcher where they are, trying to understand what they need and being flexible and responsive to their challenges uh, and priorities where possible and feasible, of course. Um, and if, if practices of the researchers as they're 
performing them in the wild don't match what is perceived to be best practices. Um, we hope that by building relationships with researchers and, and helping them implement solutions to their challenges, um, that through that activity, they'll have added time and interest to engage in conversations about new approaches as well. So uh, that's all that I wanted to share, but in closing, I would like to thank Joan, Paige, CNI, and my, my co-presenters and all of you once more for this opportunity uh, to talk about two things that I'm really interested in. Uh, I hope it resonates with some of you out there and provides further opportunities um, for, for me to learn about what, what you're doing in, in your area and how you're tackling some of these issues. Thank you. Jay, thank you so much. Uh, I really think that you've given people so much to think about and uh, some models um, of practice that others may want to follow. Um, I'm going to combine two questions and ask you right now, and we'll take more at the end. So don't worry if you have a question for Jay or others, we'll go back to earlier questions at the end of the, all of the presentations. So the two questions are both about staff. They're slightly different variations. One is, um, are the staff in the Sherman Center all employed by the library or other units also? And then she said, I, I think you mentioned ARC staff. And the other question is about whether there are staff uh, working in the, these arenas who have dual roles, for example, someone doing, doing reference and instruction, but also working in the Sherman Center or um, perhaps a metadata specialist or something like that. Thanks, Joan. Yeah, it, it it might be a complex answer to give because mm -hmm. we we purposefully try to blur the lines. I would say sometimes between the Sherman Center and the library and the functions that we um, serve there. To answer the question, um, for a a long period of time, we had shared roles with our ARC group, which, which is RHPCS here. Um, our RDM specialists were both 50-50 split between the library and the high performance computing uh, service. Um, what's happened relatively recently is that they did a restructuring there and they they narrowed their scope. And, and so we've taken, you know, technically they they fully report into the library, but the but the understanding is that they're still part of the DRCP, which is then therefore a part of the Office of the VP of Research. We've also adopted the, the research software development team from that unit as well. And so they're based within the library, but still devoted to, um, to the broader initiative. Um, in, terms of, in terms of dual roles, um, the, the folks that I, that I showed there, they are, they are pretty much um, committed to the Sherman Center. But as you might notice, you know, some of the services that are provided at the Sherman Center are what could be thought of as traditional library services as well. And so we're, we're, we're essentially taking some of those services, or we've taken some of those services and moved them inside the Sherman Center, but there, there are library services uh, that are being offered. Um, we have done with some of the individuals who have joined to support things like research and information management and some of the new DRCP staff. We've, uh, we've taken them organizationally and put them inside the Sherman Center so that they have a team with which to connect and work with. Um, and in that way, they're establishing stronger connections with uh, the individuals around them. But uh, to some extent, they are supporting, I guess, other initiatives. And so I, I guess in summary, we 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 take advantage of flexibility and, and blurring the lines where, where organizationally it's, it's convenient to us. I figured it would be a complex answer <laughs> because you've got so much going on and you have partnerships uh, both within and, and, um, with, and with other units in the university and that does lead to complex relationships. Okay, thank you again so much, Jay. We'll have more questions for you later. Um, and some questions may be for all of our presenters. So next up, we have uh, Anne and, and uh, Joe. So please start your screen share and uh, whenever you're ready, please proceed. All right, thank you, Joan and Jay. That was great. I think there's a lot that uh, resonates with, and we'll see that across our presentation too. But uh, Joe and I are, are here to talk about digital scholarship at the University of Michigan. And we'll start first with some brief introductions. Joe, why don't you go ahead? Hi, I'm Joe, I go by he, him pronouns and I'm a digital scholarship research consultant in the uh, College of Literature, Science and Arts in uh, University of Michigan. And I'm Anne Conquin. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the director of digital scholarship at the University of Michigan Library. Um, and this is 
So two collaborators coming together to talk about how we run digital scholarship at U of M. And this is our agenda for this brief presentation. Yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about our context um, and how we're doing digital scholarship. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a run through of the Anti-Racist Digital Research Initiative, which is a newer kind of initiative for us. Um, and take a few moments to talk through um, some of the um, up and coming social and environmental impacts and uh, a little bit about safety and security of, with digital bodies and think about kind of the things that we're doing in the future. Yeah. All right. Um, so first, we also wanted to start with um, acknowledging where we're coming from doing this presentation. Uh, at the University of Michigan, we trace uh, our university's origins to a land grant from the Anishinaabeg and Wyandot when in 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This land was offered ceremonially in, as a gift through the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated. We acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the U.S., on lands obtained in unconscionable ways from Indigenous peoples. Through scholarship and pedagogy, we work to create a future in which the past is thoroughly understood and the present supports justice and human flourishing. And this is just, this is not enough, but this is an acknowledgement. So the University of Michigan is a large public institution um, and it's an R1 research oriented one that is uh, very decentralized. Uh, we have 19 schools and colleges plus a library and a big hospital. And Anne is from the library, so. Yes, and <laughs> so uh, our digital scholarship program is run in the library, the central library. Ours is a fairly young program. Uh, we're just wrapping up a three-year service pilot and currently in the process of doing assessment. Um, and because we're in the library, we do have some core services that we offer. And many of these are done in collaboration with Joe um, and his team. So we offer a lot of consultations related to you know, teaching, research, um, the whole gamut. Uh, we offer several public events throughout the year and workshops. So we lead you know, a series of digital scholarship 101 workshops, workshops related to digital methods and tools. Um, and we also offer project support. And we have tiered levels of support depending on our, you know, our relationship with the, the researchers, the kind of projects they're working on um, and what commitments we have to them. And then we also act provide limited access to technologies and platforms. Um, we don't have a lot of capacity at the University of Michigan libraries. My team is quite small. It's myself. We have a metadata engagement librarian and a digital scholarship librarian. We have a couple of vacancies we haven't been able to hire in. And because of that, our relationship with uh, Joe and LSA has been really important. Outside of digital collections, our digital repositories, online exhibits, and our publishing platforms, we don't have a lot of capacity or infrastructure to support digital research projects. So I'll let Joe talk about um, the LSA piece of that. Yeah. So um, including me, there's about four FTE across several different people and teams within LSA's technology services. Um, we have uh, who are dedicated to doing work on digital scholarship projects. Um, so we have systems administrators, developers, designers, user experience designers, GIS folks, HPC folks, so on and so forth. Um, and between the library and LSA, we have about five people who are in basically like a core hub um, to expand on Jay's <laughs> terms. Um, and uh, we work very closely together, um, do a lot of like triage of any kinds of um, incidents or tickets that come in, things like that. Um, and then kind of beyond that, there's a, about two dozen folks in um, a DS advisory group, which is made up of library and LSA folks and folks also from like our other Flint and Dearborn campuses and so forth. Um, and it just makes sense for LSA to work with the library on so closely on a lot of these, because as we started tracking projects, we noticed that, that over 70% of the LSA projects that we handle have somebody from the library working with us as well. So, yeah. Um, another thing that's very interesting about um, the way that we work is that we uh, have this shared values and principles that guide our work. And they're linked in the... Uh, 
in the slides there, but I think I can put the link in here for everybody. Um, <laughs> and very quickly, because um, we don't have time to go through them all, but it's like we're our principles are around DEI, anti-racism, accessibility, openness, transparency, care and consent, and connection and partnership. And these weren't like Ann and I telling folks, this is what our principles are. This was like us all working together to kind of uh, have these emerge from how we wanted to work. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll talk first about our anti-racist digital research initiative. Um, and this is a pilot initiative that we're, we are just wrapping up right now, doing assessment and rethinking what this, the future of this program looks like. But it emerged, um, I think we proposed it late in 2020 after George, the, the killing of George Floyd and you know the racial reckoning happening at U.S. campuses. Um, and this is a pilot program, many grants that we are offered, offering out of the library, so it's library funds. Um, and it also serves as a sort of assessment mechanism. Um, college of LSNA is the largest college at U of M. Uh, we hear a lot from those faculty, but we had a sense that there were other faculty and other researchers doing digital scholarship across our campus and campuses, um, including Flint and Dearborn, but we didn't know how to hear from those faculty. They don't always respond to surveys, um, interview requests. So um, this program provided $5,000 in startup funds, and then a lot of consultation and technical support from the library and the LSA technology services team. Um, we provide planning support from like the very beginning, like before they start work on their project, all the way through thinking about planning and preservation. We also provided access to library and technical expertise, and this included to uh, community partners and research collaborators who might not have an affiliation with the, with the university. So we were learning a lot and pushing, I think, a lot of the boundaries <laughs> about uh, you know what library services look like and who has access to these these resources and i will say that the technical support um, was really extraordinary in the slides um, i think once those are shared the images actually link to the pages on the library website so you can see what the process looked like um, for you know applications and review and we held a series of office hours for the month leading up to the deadline um, for this grant project but Joe will talk about technical support and the statistics that come out of this on the next slide. Yeah, so we had about 12 folks in the core team doing the reviews um, as facilitators and organizers for this whole thing. Um, and like Ann mentioned, we had six awardees that was out of about 34 applications. Um, and the budget for the whole thing was about $31,000. Um, over the full year that we were supporting uh, those six projects, uh, we, uh, with consulting time, with developer time and design time, um, we spent around 3,600 hours um, working with those projects. Oh, and I forgot to mention um, that our other large institutional partner was the National Center for Institutional Diversity, uh, which is a research center located in the College of, of LSNA. And they were willing to provide affiliation status um, to any of the researchers who were not affiliated with LSA so they could have access to LSA resources. So we were trying to find really creative ways to make friends and expand access to institutional resources that were otherwise you know, very limited. Um, and those core team of reviewers included folks from the library, including our head of uh, DEIA in the library, um, member representatives from the National Center for Institutional Diversity, our technical support folks. So they all brought their, these different perspectives in as we reviewed these applications. So we could think about, you know, the research questions, how ethical the research was, but also is this feasible? Um, and I think all of those perspectives were really important as we reviewed those, those applications. We'll talk a little bit at the end about um, how this went um, and what we're learning um, as we do all of this work. Yeah, so now we're going to kind of shift focus a little bit towards uh, social environmental impacts of things and also safeguarding digital bodies. So um, I should say that, uh, so I'll start first by talking about social and environmental impacts um, and note that all of this work is happening within a larger institutional context. There are quite a few initiatives that are happening at U of M. Uh, we have a plan Blue, Planet Blue initiative. Our campus is trying to go carbon neutral within the next decade. Um, but locally, we're, we're taking small steps as part of a, you know, a 
contrib contributing to larger efforts. We're closing local server rooms and moving towards more efficient use of shared space and resources. Um, but most importantly, I think what we're trying, what we're doing is building a lot of relationships and supporting research that is happening within research centers across campus and supporting the work of faculty members, students um, that are working to address issues of anti-racism, of social justice. Um, and a lot of this work is happening in places like the Center for Social Solutions, Poverty Solutions, the School for Environment Sustainability, um, the Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism, the DISCO Network. This is a Mellon-funded project. And these are just a handful of the folks that we work with. So we work with researchers across campus and try to you know, support that work that's happening. Um, and so much of the expertise is amongst, you know, spread and distributed across our, our faculty. So trying to contribute um, in the ways that we can. Jody, do you want to add to that? Should we move on? Okay. Right. So um, given our principles and values, um, it's probably no surprise that we um, uh, are influenced by things like the consentful tech and uh, our data bodies. And those kinds of um, readings talk about, and they introduce us to this term of the digital body. And it's kind of like thinking through, um, you know, you take care of your physical body. Um, you know, there's certain things you do, you eat healthy, you exercise, that kind of thing, and you protect it. Um, and then thinking through in a digital sense, like online, how do you protect your, your body? How do you care and feed for it and so forth? So that's the digital body. And what we've been trying to think through and help um, our IT shops with is how to help uh, researchers who are working in like anti-racist uh, work or um, doing all kinds of other social work um, and maybe even activist work to understand sort of the, how we can try and help um, protect the digital body uh, of our researchers. So, you know, for example, like questions like how do you protect yourself when you're on, you know, targeted on some sort of watch list, um, you know, as a faculty member or as a student or researcher, um, you know, how do you how do you study a certain topic without getting any sort of threats or physical harm, things like that. Lots of really you know, tough questions. And um, in some ways it's been challenging uh, working with some of the IT security areas only because um, when you start talking about these topics, um, sometimes it's difficult to kind of get them to think of it in this sort of digital body sense but then once you start talking to them there's a lot of you know uh, energy behind it so that's what we've been doing um and you know we're hoping that in the future we'll be able to come back and tell you about all the cool things we've been doing in this space and i should say that a lot of this work is precipitated by our relationships with researchers um, and I think we had graduate students from the Digital Studies Institute who had applied for like our scholar sprints where we, we connected them with library and technical support folks, students who were work, like studying white supremacists on social media and asking us like, how do I keep myself and my family safe? Um, and how do I not expose myself to risk and harm? Um, and I think we're having, it's these relationships and being engaged in that work that has really moved this work forward. All right. So what are we doing now? We are doing a lot of assessment, um, especially with the anti-racist digital research initiative. Um, and we're trying to think about ways to iterate and transform this the process, the, the format and structure of it. Um, it's been primarily a lot of um, engagements online through Zoom webinars and, and sessions, cons consultations, that is really challenging sometimes for our, our faculty and our graduate students um, who also teach and do research during the academic year to attend a lot of these trainings. So we're thinking about uh, combining this with our digital scholarship certificate program, turning that into a fellowship and making this a like an intensive in-person or you know, simultaneous synchronous event um, so that folks can have the time to learn the, you know, the central tenets that we're trying to teach them about accessibility, about doing ethical research, um, and give them face time to work with our, our experts in the library and LSA technology services. Um, we're also, let me see, 
preparing our staff and ourselves to support anti-racist, socially engaged, and community-centered work. I think the will is there amongst our folks to be able to support this work, but whether or not we're actually prepared to do it is another question we've been getting. I think some some challenging feedback for us to hear that sometimes um, the way that folks show up isn't necessarily conducive to like supporting that work. And I think this is challenging because not all of the folks who are supporting this work report to Joe or myself. So thinking how do we, you know, prepare and train the, these folks who really want to support this work? How do we take a systematic approach and improve our, our staffing and our capacity to not just support the digital part of the scholarship, but also engage as you know, peers and partners in this research. Um, we're working within institutional structures, building relationships and negotiating with various stakeholders. I think Joe spoke to this in the, uh, the digital bodies work um, where we can't do all of this on our own and we rely very heavily on our relationships with our partners. And I think we're working, we're learning that there are different cultures in these spaces as well. So navigating and negotiating those. And as we're um, wrapping up our pilot of our service and thinking about what the service looks like in a stable form moving forward, um, we're having design sessions and conversations with those service partners and collaborators, thinking about shared resources and you know, virtual spaces that we can bring them in um, and centralize some of this, um, how we share this information. Am I leaving anything out in that summary? Okay. All right, well, we'll leave it there for now. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or to Joe. This is our contact info. I'll stop sharing now. Joan, I think you're muted. You wouldn't think I'd ever done this before. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Anne and Joe. Uh, when we had some back and forth in preparation for this webinar, I was just fascinated by the range of things that you're tackling, the difficult topics. I personally have not heard of anyone else doing things about the safeguarding digital bodies work in, in this context. I would love it if any of our participants are doing this work in their own libraries or universities, um, if you would put that in the chat. We, we're not going to discuss it right now, but I would be very interested in following up on that. I think it's a um, it's such a an important topic and something that's really community oriented uh, towards our our whole university um, constituency. So thank you so much. I'll have one quick question for you, um, and that is. Um, uh, do you have any spaces in the library that support this work? So we, um, I think I mentioned that we're not a center. We also don't really have physical space in the library. We have, you know, these pilot spaces. We just did like a renovation of a massive floor of our, our undergraduate library. And I think we're still trying to figure out like what, what, our services look like since they've been virtual for so long, like so much of the, the pilot happened during the pandemic. Um, and now that we're transitioning back into physical space, like how do we uh, make that transition, what it looks like? How do we use space intentionally? And I think there are so many, you know, important needs of the library for like student study space, you know, um, events and those kinds of things that we haven't yet answered those questions. What is the you know, a project space look like in the library. But we do have, you know, other areas in the library, like our design lab that we work fairly closely with that has like the maker's space. Um, and the we also have the computer and video game archive. So we partner with all of those folks, but we don't have our own like digital scholarship space. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to you with some more questions at the end. And now over to Lauren. Thanks um, so much. Please go ahead and share your slides. Can everyone see my slides? Not yet. No. Yeah, now we can. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I am very excited to be 
uh, discussing Yale's approaches to digital scholarship, um, our library is very much at the beginning of a transformative process to rethink what digital scholarship looks like and to actually reorganize our structure and approaches to better meet the needs of our researchers and students. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of sort of beginning things, a lot of first principle things that we're going to be doing. Um, for context, I am only two months into my role here. And we're currently in the middle of a search for the director of a new department called Computational Methods and Data that is now responsible for the equivalent of digital scholarship spaces and services. So we are still figuring out what this work will look like. We will be in experimentation mode for a while, uh, playing around with how to structure programs and support internal and external relationships, exploring what that means, um, and probing staff knowledge and expertise to build services and spaces that make sense for the library and the university in this current moment, but also moving into the future. That's all. So that's all to say, don't hold me too tightly to what I described today. Uh, it's really very much the beginning. Um, so again, to kind of help situate where we are now and where we're planning to go, I'm going to start by briefly describing what digital scholarship looked like before. Um, then I'll discuss our current thinking and approaches, as well as some factors driving change. I think that's really important to kind of help understand the why behind what we're doing. Um, and then I'll review some specific activities we're starting to undertake to move the program forward. So um, earlier configurations of our digital scholarship work were comprised of four distinct work streams organized within strong disciplinary boundaries. So we had a digital humanities lab that was a space, and we still do, a space and, and suite of services designed to build out projects and prototypes for researchers asking humanistic questions that would benefit from digital methods. We have a stats lab um, that has a dedicated space that offered basic statistical and data analysis support via consultation and code review. Um, and this service was primarily staffed by graduate students. Um, we had a research data support program that was forming and made up of a few individual contributors, providing mostly subject specific support, primarily in medical, STEM and social sciences, and also in the professional schools. And a GIS program with dedicated GIS librarian um, supported by graduate student consultants. So I feel like this is a fairly common kind of model in some ways or elements of this are very familiar to folks. Um, the DH lab reported through the library's arts and humanities portfolio, while the stats, GIS, and data folks reported through the library science and social science portfolio. So there were two organizational leaders with digital scholarship responsibilities. Um, and despite best intentions, this kind of disciplinary focus, uh, kind of especially split across portfolios, ended up creating conditions that siloed the work and created some challenging barriers to collaboration. And I want to be clear that collaboration was happening across programs and services. Uh, staff are doing their best to find opportunities to work together, but those collaborations were personality and project dependent, right? It wasn't a feature baked into the structure. So you had to work harder to get there. And those connections could feel a little uncertain there one day and maybe not the next. <coughs> Pardon me. So we ended up with these kind of four fiefdoms where the emphasis became building vertically rather than across. And it became hard to understand what digital scholarship looked like at the organizational level. It was hard for our users to know where to go, harder still to see the, the needs and opportunities that cross cut the programs. And really the approach made it hard to be strategic, right? And to actually support the work at scale. We actually weren't really meeting our needs. So to help build an organization-wide view and to address some of the unintended consequences of organizing work so strongly within disciplinary pillars, a fairly significant reorganization of the library took place that merged the arts and humanities and science and social sciences portfolios into one big research and learning portfolio. So this has led to the creation of my AUL role and to that new department, computational methods and data. So in this new arrangement, the four digital scholarship work streams are now merged into one unit. And so the key areas of work include exploring opportunities to leverage data and computation to inform and extend research and learning across the disciplines, developing and nurturing relationships and collaborations across the university's growing research support ecosystem, and investing efforts and resources into need finding and assessment to ensure that the services offered actually address the gaps um, and complement or enhance those provided by other units. So really strong organizational awareness is key to the, the work that we're engaging in now. So our new directions for digital scholarship are very much aligned with the strategies guiding the work of the new portfolio. So computational methods and data is part of a larger team that will advance a coordinated and library-wide vision for research and learning services. And I think it's important to call this out because the shift to the computational methods and data department is not just about bringing allied work together into a single department, it's bigger than that. Um, this is an opportunity to embed digital scholarship tools and approaches into research and learning efforts across the board. 
and a way to feed needs from across the organization into digital scholarship um, services. So we have this really wonderful feedback loop that I think was missing before. Um, and it's a way to sort of accelerate the delivery of more targeted services and expertise, hopefully in sustainable ways. Another key responsibility for this portfolio is nurturing and developing relationships and partnerships. And I know this is a very basic premise of digital scholarship work, right? You can't get anywhere without collaboration and champions. And certainly I'm interested in using the research and learning portfolio's broad scope to spark interdisciplinary connections and to create new research and teaching opportunities. Um, but what I'm most interested in exploring, at least right now, is how to position computational methods and data as a node in a network of research and discovery at Yale, right? How can we position this team to be an ongoing in conversation and negotiation with other actors engaging in digital and data informed practices? And how could we come together to create meaningful new possibilities, right? Can we create new enabling infrastructures, new models for delivering support and expertise? So I'd like to explore how collaborations across the university can change not just what we do, but how we do what we do. And I hope some of my, my examples later on will sort of start to speak to this. So it can mean thinking about more porous or fluid organizational structures, right? I might mean on taking on entirely new roles and responsibilities. And for us, it'll really be about honing in our value proposition, you know, getting really clear about what it is that we offer that others don't or can't. And so finally, this portfolio has a charge uh, to align offerings with the university's strategic priorities. So for digital scholarship in particular, I think this means acknowledging that we are um, part of a much larger team, right? We are part of the research enterprise and the way we develop and apply digital scholarship skills, knowledge, spaces, and tools should be informed by robust organizational awareness and should be in service to those highest organizational goals. So that is our driver here, right? It's, it's gonna be less about um, maybe Pre older ways of do or earlier ways of doing things and more about what we need today to, to really get aligned. Um, at Yale right now, much strategy is focused on supporting computational and data informed research and learning. Um, there's a number of strategies out there. Some key ones that are guiding our thinking and efforts now are the university science strategy, which articulates data science as a key university priority. It emphasizes interdisciplinary research and acknowledges the importance of research data management. Um, the Humanities Doctoral Education Report, which calls for supporting and growing interdisciplinary research in the humanities and demands support for non-traditional dissertation forms. The Data Intensive Social Science Strategy, which formed a new research center that is operating as a coordinating space for services and expertise for social science researchers and their collaborators, particularly uh, with uh, data-based research. Um, and as the strategic vision report for the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which strongly emphasizes interdisciplinary collaboration and the creation of new structures to support partnership and impact. So a really you know, good portion of the library's response to the university strategy, strategy is the creation of this computational methods and data department. It's the department, um, it's one of the key places where we'll support data informed research and learning, enable interdisciplinary connections and initiatives and create space and support for novel and creative approaches to research driven by digital methods and computation. So I hope it's becoming clear just how aligned we're trying to get here and sort of what's driving this shift to, to this, this, new, uh, this new department and this new way of working. But you might be wondering, what does it look like, right? How have, what have we been doing to advance these new approaches? Um, and that's a great question. It's an open question. It's something we are still exploring, but I can talk about some stuff that we are currently undertaking. Um, so we've really started to go back to kind of first principles here. We're digging in with to assessment and user engagement. So yes, we've had a program that's been operational for years and we want to go into this new uh, articulation with fresh eyes, right? So with support from our assessment and user experience group, we've completed a service inventory of the four work streams to see where there are overlaps, differences, and continuities. And that's going to help us level set as we think about creating department-wide or even library-wide services. We've also engaged in listening tours, you know, just talking to people to understand their perspectives. Um, our DH program manager, for example, comp compiled, completed a really robust listening tour when she joined the organization. Um, and in doing my own listening tour, I was able to kind of really accelerate my onboarding um, and kind of help develop some strategies and do some sanity checking around our, our approaches, right? Does this even make sense? Is it resonating with, our, with the people that we have to work with and support? And I think this is great data for the incoming director to work with as they establish, get established in the role. So this is, I think, a space that's still quite emergent and I, and I hope that we can provide more sort of definition around it. But I wanted to just make sure that I created space for the fact, to talk about the fact that we are really going right back down to the foundation here to understand what do people need? So what you're seeing on this slide is just some themes that have emerged from some of that work. 
we're also exploring new ways of collaborating and partnering. So thinking about deepening engagement and thinking about getting closer to the research, which are kind of key themes for us, we've partnered with that new research center, the Data Informed Social Science Center, to actually share one of our data librarian positions. Um, and we're looking for opportunities to uh, engage with other researchers, research centers to do the same. So for this experiment, as I, we're kind of thinking of it, we've reworked the, this one data librarian's job description to create a dotted line to the center's executive director. We've created a space for the center staff to report to the librarian. And, uh, and the uh, library and the center are actually splitting both the FTE and the compensation. So this is like really structural foundational connections and support here. Um, what I like about this is that it creates potentially um, more enduring structures for partnership. So if the center ch leadership changes or if our data librarian moves on or whatever else might happen in the course of work, um, the connection may can persist, right? Um, this is also helpful for us because the center is really the kind of um, heart of a lot of uh, data informed research for social scientists at, at Yale University. They're going to the center first. And so as their, for, as, as their first stop, it actually allows us to kind of work directly with them a little, with a little bit more ease, right? And we can, through that space and through that program, start to build more awareness of library services and expertise. We can connect researchers to our resources and coordinate things like data purchasing across units and kind of take on more of that coordination role, which is hard to do when you're also asking people to come to you. So, I think this is sort of a, a, a model that is really uh, dependent on Yale's organizational culture for us to go into the research center. I don't know that it might apply to every organization, but it's one that feels like it has some legs here because of the way our researchers approach seeking out help and where they expect to find help. So that's gonna be one we're gonna keep our eye on. If it's successful, we're gonna maybe push into other places as well. Um, as our embedded data librarians, hopefully plural, uh, will be providing support across the research lifecycle at a very high level and very close to where the researchers are doing their work, it means that we have to rethink how we're supporting other data needs across the board. So we're really looking at a distributed support model um, where we're defined data support tiers and assign some level of responsibility for data support across every librarian in research and learning. So across in all disciplines. Um, so the highest levels of support will come from that computational methods and data department, but we'll have different kinds of tiers in different places. Uh, we're also, so just to flesh that out, we're gonna to have to add in more FTEs in functional roles like data creation, reproducibility, possibly open science or open scholarship. So we're kind of experimenting essentially with a model that lets us kind of sp spread out wide, but also go deep. Um, figuring out the FTE piece of this is uh, interesting. And I think we're getting there, uh, but I, I think without doing both of these things in tandem, we're not gonna be able to actually succeed. Um, we are also looking at reconfiguring the stats lab to hone in on key gaps in the research support ecosystem. So we're most likely going to regroup around hands-on methodological support and code review for reproducibility. So trying to get really specific about what it is that we're doing, um, rather than sort of offering a very generic service around stat statistical support. We're also gonna revisit the staffing model there to improve service and sustainability. Um, we need to be able to provide more consistency and to ensure that we can provide support for highly requested areas that aren't covered anywhere else. Funnily enough, qualitative data analysis, like no one's doing this on campus. So we, we are gonna step up to the plate and take responsibility for this. Um, and we're also reflecting on how to reframe digital humanities support. So our small but mighty DH team has done great work exploring strengths and challenges facing the lab. And based on that work, we'll be rethinking, you know, scope, charge and purpose of the lab, as well as finding ways to reassert this space and program as a key intellectual hub for the DH community. Um, much of this work will focus on engaging research faculty who have recently been hired to do digital humanities work, which is so interesting in some of these academic departments, people are coming in with this mandate to do, to do digital humanities. Um, and they've kind of created these little group of schools with graduate students and other folks. And so can we bring these folks together um, and provide additional kind of yeah, coordination, support, uh, deepening engagement. So we'll try to deepen our work with graduate students there as well. And um, I, a really obvious opening for us is a focus on interdisciplinary support and non-traditional dissertation support. So what does this look like? What training is necessary to make this happen? What's the afterlife of the, that, that kind of dissertation project look like as well? Um, and then kind of connected to that, we'll be collaborating to deliver certificate programs on topics like critical computing. So this would be with humanities faculty. 
Um, and finally, key efforts will continue to be around ensuring that the library has a seat at the table when it comes to decisions about research data. Um, we're collaborating with research centers, the VPR's office, the CIO, and others to deliver key infrastructure like a data repository and data discovery workflows. And we're really kind of adv advising on institutional data sharing, retention, and preservation policies um, and contributing to research data conversations wherever we can, right? And also really try to push for open practices and open infrastructure wherever we can. Since Yale is at this at sort of an earlier stage in this process, um, I think we have a strong opportunity to kind of build some of this stuff in from the beginning, which I think is exciting and wouldn't happen unless we were at those tables. Um, we're also going to be leading engagement and education efforts, uh, which include helping researchers make sense of the university's service and support environment. So this is, I think, is a common theme across um, all of our presentations today. We have lots of stuff, lots of help. No one knows how to find it. So it really sort of sitting in that role um, and trying to make sense of that rich, complex and fragmented environment. And that uh, is another way that I think we're also building out those partnerships, because by asking those questions and by kind of putting your hand up to say, OK, we'll do it, it, put, it's, it puts you at the table and it helps you build out those relationships as well as well so that's a super quick tour of what's happening at Yale um, thank you for your attention today and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have thank you so much Lauren what an ambitious agenda it's almost making my head spin <laughs> and, and I have a couple of questions um, that really apply to all of you, but um, specifically, I'd like to start out with you, Lauren, to ask about, uh, you used the phrase, uh, and I had written it down earlier too, the seat at the table. And I'm going to, after you respond, I'm like each of our presenters to address how they believe their libraries have been successful in getting a seat at the table. You, of course, are very new at Yale. So I don't know how much you know about the role of the dean, the role of um, people with different specialties, but do you have some, uh, it's really what I'm looking for, strategies and advice for our participants of how to get a seat at the table. Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky because I, I walked into an organization that was sort of already primed for that. And I think Barbara Rockenbach, RUL, has done a lot of work. Um, she's fairly new as well. I think it's about three-ish years that she's been in, in that role. And uh, I, I know that, it's a lot of uh, boots on the ground kind of effort, you know, making the case for the library. Uh, and I know that uh, she's been responsible for, just, you know, initiating some collaborations with the VPR's office, with the CIO, with our high performance computing group to kind of pull together, you know, uh, different kinds of committees and groups to kind of, kind of get people to think together and think of the library as part of that. That's been a wonderful foundation to build from, right? Because it allows us to then, use some of the work and ideas that's that spin out of those groups to you know connect with directors of research centers or faculty to say hey this is happening we're hearing about this are you hearing about this and they are because of all those connections and we can kind of build from there so they think of the library when it comes to a data repository question or they think of the library when it comes to gosh who knows about data preservation who could we ask so i think it's it's like a longer term project it's not a single strategy at least here that that seems to be my impression it's about kind of going wide and deep again, right? Uh, and so I, I think also focusing in on people who are already saying yes. So if we have that strong relationship with the Data Informed Social Science Center, trust that I'm going to be working with that executive director on a lot of projects because, you know, we, we're working together, it's working, and he's got the year of the provost, we can kind of make stuff happen in that way as well. So quick answer there, maybe not super useful, but from, from my perspective now, that's what I can see. Sure it is, yes. Thank you. Jay, how about you next? Sure, thanks, Jonah. I, I think I can echo a lot of uh, what, what Lauren was saying. I think it it's incredibly valuable to have leadership, and we have leadership here in the library that has worked for a long time to build relationships with units across campus. And, and often, I think it's just a case of, you know, being there and being available. And to what Lauren said is, you know, just saying yes to things and to volunteer to lead things in cases where everyone's looking around at each other, wondering who's going to lead it. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to just kind of embrace it and uh, demonstrate the value that, uh, that the library can, can add to the, the research support environment. Thank you. Ann and Joe? Yes, very similar response over here. I think it's taken several years for us to just of like const consistently showing up in different spaces um, and becoming trusted partners. I've become like a 
an ex officio member of the steering committee of our humanities collaboratory. Joe and I have been attending like faculty meetings of the Digital Studies Institute. And I think just showing up in these spaces and, you know, participating as, as peers and colleagues has developed trust in those spaces so that when things come up, people know who to turn to with their questions. Um, and I think having, like, I have a very supportive AUL. So even when you know, resources were like locked down during the pandemic and we wanted to do the anti-racist digital research initiative. When we put together our request, she was willing to actually take a risk and push for something like this. And I think having leadership that is willing to, to trust you to take a risk um, is really, really important. And I think for, for Joe, um, we've done so much in just connecting our leadership. So now they have regular meetings. Like, um, I don't know if you want to talk, speak to that, Joe, because uh, we're in two different parts of the university, but I think our leadership are now in communication with each other, which is great. Yeah, I think, you know, it was very early on. I think there were a lot of times we were doing coffee with folks and just, you know, talking to people um, and conversing. I know that in some cases, some of the relationships between um, IT shops and libraries can be, you know, chilly. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it was really cool to be able to see um, folks coming together and, you know, we were finding common ground on a lot of stuff. So that's, that's, that's the way to go. Thank you. I'm going to go back to a question um, that is both uh, for Anne and Joe. I think you may have answered it to some extent when you talked about the assessment of your um, anti-racism project, but the question is, how are you thinking about the sustainability of the pilot program? Do you have anything to add uh, to that? Yeah, so there's, um, I think, a couple of pieces to that because we are thinking about the sustainability of that, that grant program. Um, and I think the, the current partners will, will really make or break that, that project. So the, the library has committed to some, to funding that for the next three years. And our university provost has also, or yeah, provost has funded uh, through the National Center for Institutional Diversity and Anti-Racism Collaborative, which has a great deal of funding. Um, and they're willing to, you know, cost share in this and continue to be partners moving forward. We actually will probably have to find new partners in LSA for that. Um, and we're, I mean, Joe and I have been working on a provost request to centralize um, some of this work so we can expand access to this beyond LSA um, so that we don't need these that research center partner. But we're also thinking about the sustainability of the service pilot in the library. Um, and we've, I think, experienced some growing pains because we've been fairly successful. People now know who to go to for, for help, and we get a lot of requests. Um, but our staffing hasn't increased. And I think we're also filling in gaps uh, within the library that have been, you know, I think, uh, somewhat underfunded in, in recent years around like online exhibits and text and data mining. Uh, so our staff are stretched and we're trying to figure out ways to sustain some of these services or maybe cut back um, and think about what we must uh, provide moving forward, what we can actually reasonably expect of our staff um, and our services. But there are a lot of difficult conversations talking with our partners, and I think there will be a lot of transition moving forward. Yeah, and from a technical perspective, we have um, done a lot of work to figure out what our capacities are and throughput. So we know that we can support about 14 new projects every year. And so, you know, we have the numbers at hand so that we can go to funding sources and say, you know, if you want us to do more projects, then it, you know, it, it costs us this much more in FTE of this type to, to be able to fund that. So folks know you know, what they'll get for what they spend. Well, I think that's really interesting, Joe. And I think it's one of the things that um, perhaps more programs will try to quantify and pay more attention to both tiers of service and what uh, constitutes um, service in, in those tiers, um, how many projects you have capacity for it, what range of projects, how you set priorities. All of those things as these programs mature, I think will become more and more important. Well, I have another question for all of you. 
Um, but in the meantime, while we get, hear the responses, I'd be very interested in hearing your questions. Um, so I'll first ask mine and then I see one just came in, which is great, and I'll get to that next. So my question is that all of you use the word research a lot about your researchers and very few of you used anything about teaching and learning and students. And in our digital scholarship um, forums and in other work I've done, often the people working directly in digital scholarship tell me that there's a lot of intertwining or interconnectedness between the faculty doing research and how they're either uh, involving their students in that research or they're using the products of that research in their instruction. Uh, and other ways. Um, now, I believe all of you are probably referring to graduate students as well as faculty when you talked about researchers, perhaps or perhaps not. But tell me, tell us uh, all a little bit more about whether you're working with undergrads or whether you're working with faculty in uh, because they'll be working with undergrads or their products. So let's start with Lauren. Again, I know you're new, so I don't know how many examples mm -hmm. you have, but I think you understand what I'm asking. And the title of your position is research and learning. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Um, and so this is an area that I, uh, that we are currently contending with. And I think it's going to be, uh, I, I, I ultimately, ultimately, we will be incorporating research and learning into our digital scholarship services. Yes, absolutely. What does that look like is an interesting question. Um, at Yale, we have a very strong center for teaching and learning. So it'll probably uh, be in partnership with the Purvu Center. Um, this uh, center for teaching and learning does actually in many ways a lot of work that a library might have typically taken on also. And so uh, whether it's with digital pedagogy or um, things of that nature. And so I, that is an area that is um, ripe for collaboration. And I'd love to sort of dig into a little bit more, especially around quantitative reasoning requirements that come out of courses and, and things like that. There might be some interesting things there with the data emphasis. I just don't know enough, um, but that's there's like a pin in that that I'd love to keep exploring. But otherwise, yes, faculty focus is quite strong. So when it comes to partnering with the research centers, it is research faculty who are going to these, these places and looking for help. Um, we employ graduate students to provide support. So we, there's a training element there where we can kind of get help, get people the right set of skills to kind of provide that support if they're coming in with, um, you know, training and, you know, they don't R, but they want to learn Python, we can set them up with that. But in terms of inst instructional support, that's not the emphasis for us right now. It's really about um, connecting with researchers, because that's what we're hearing um, from our listening tours and from our, our, our partners and stakeholders. Thank you. Jay, would you like to comment? Sure, thanks. And I'm glad you asked the question and, and given us a chance to, to reflect on that a little bit. I, you know, I think we, we see that as um, equally as important as the research support we do, because in many cases with graduate students and undergraduate students, research and learning are very closely integrated with each other uh, anyway. Um, so we, you know, through the time that we've, we've um, offering programming through the, the Sherman Center, we've, we've regularly worked with instructors to bring the digital approaches and tools into the classroom and, and integrate them into the course curricula. It's not something that we can do at, at, at incredible scales because it is very time intensive to 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 build that instruction into the curricula, but we do that a, a number of times a year, several times a year, I would think on average, is someone will engage in that type of uh, um, that work with an instructor, and it's it's actually a, a really powerful way of bringing those students into the community and also the instructor as well. Um, we run a, a graduate residency program here that is that is headed by our academic director, Andrew Safiro. Um, who, and that program brings in about 10 graduate students from, from all across campus and embeds them in the Sherman Center and provides um, a lot of uh, a lot of professionalization opportunities for them and then direct project support with projects that are directly related to or kind of tangentially related to things that they're working on in their research. Um, and we've, we've also over the last few years um, put a lot more uh, resources into a program we call the DASH service, which is Data Analysis Support Hub. Um, and, and that's a uh, mostly a peer-to-peer. -peer, so it's graduate students that are providing the, the, the 
grunt level service supporting pre predominantly gr undergraduate students who are using data analysis um, tools and methods in their in their classwork as well and so we, we've tried to build um, more um, engagements and points of interaction with uh, undergraduate and graduate students as well thank you and Anne and joe Yes, so um, at Michigan, Digital Scholarship is actually located in the learning and teaching division of the library. Uh, so we work closely with colleagues in research where a lot of the subject liaisons are, but we take a very pedagogical approach to how we support digital scholarship. So we are working with researchers to help them learn these new skills, like project management, teaching their students. Um, and we do a lot of instruction. So my team, we go into undergraduate and graduate classes and we teach things like introduction to digital scholarship or how to do text mining and data or text analysis. Um, we, our team also um, hires one to two graduate um, interns every semester, every year. So we work with our graduate school. Um, and I think we at this point have developed quite a reputation as a really welcoming space for for graduate students especially those in the humanities who are not sure about whether they want to continue down the tenure track in academia um, and we work fairly closely with faculty to embed the digital scholarship librarians in some of their curricular efforts so in recent years for example we've had a couple of faculty members in american culture who have taught courses around um Asian Americans at University of Michigan or Black Women in the Archives. And we have our librarians um, attending those classes, teaching sessions on accessibility and digital exhibits um, or, you know, the erasure in archives and archival practice, how to do repair, uh, engage in reparative metadata practices when creating online exhibits. Um, and these have been really wonderful I think experiences that have come out of our support of faculty research projects. So we're also in their undergraduate classes doing this work as well. And we're, um, I think in the past year or so, we we actually worked with a, an undergraduate group, student group, the United Asian American Organizations. Um, one of the students, I had done like a Wikipedia instruction in one of her classes and she came up and proposed a digital collection. They had access to materials that, um, you know, Asian American students had deposited with staff members and they wanted to digitize and create a digital collection. So these students actually, over the course of the pandemic, digitized materials, worked with our metadata engagement librarian to create the metadata. And the, the collection is now live um, on our website and it was purely student led. So we really love those kinds of projects. I think those are the most rewarding. So yes, we do a lot of that. Thank you. And Joe, you're heavily involved, I imagine, in learning. Yeah, uh, I'm actually in the research team in, oh, okay. in the um, uh, technology services area. But yes, that's it, it, they're all stuck together. There's, <laughs> there's no no escaping it. Um, and I think that, like many here have said, you know, our our use of the word scholar is very broad, um, and you know, it always for us, it means, you know, everybody from undergrad all the way through tenured faculty, even, you know, folks uh, in the community who are doing activism work or something, uh, community fellows who are related to or, you know, associated with a, a research uh, project, we work with them as well, so. Thank you. Well, I think the um, other questions have been answered in the chat. So I'm going to ask one final question of all of you. And I'm trying to think how best to phrase this. I'll give it a try. Some people feel that we shouldn't even say digital scholarship anymore because all scholarship is digital. I am not sure that's entirely correct, but let's say it's mostly correct. And we also, you know, are living digital lives. Um, digital objects and digital uh, techniques are used in teaching and learning and research, et cetera. When do you think, or do you think, that all library staff of all types will become more involved directly in providing services that we now, you know, kind of um, segregate to some degree as digital scholarship, uh, data intensive and computational? Um, each of you have touched on this a little bit in your 
um, answers to questions, but I'd like more the big picture. Is this the future? Is this going to happen? Do you think um, it will in your professional career? Lauren, my impression is that this is part of your perhaps agenda or the, the why your position was created. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I, and I do hope it will happen within my professional career. I really, <laughs> we're trying to aim for the, um, the, the date, like the, the tiered data support for sure. I, I don't know that maybe, so if we think of digital scholarship as a, a large umbrella of, uh, you know, skills, expertise, services, you know, I don't know that um, our, our the vision to have all of our librarians do digital scholarship is, is maybe accurate, but I do think what's going to become more and more important is that everybody who interacts with patrons, right, students, researchers, community, whoever is conversant enough to have that kind of first level, to, you know, conversation about what is this, so they actually know how to refer properly. It's like anything else that we do in terms of um, reference interviews, even, or kind of supporting supporting our patrons. So I think those functional skills, as we, as we sometimes call them, are going to become more and more important. Um, and I think we still need to have those specialists, right, who can truly, truly go deep. So it's, it's. I, I think it will happen sooner than, it, the need is already here, I think, in some places, and I hope that it'll happen sooner than later, but it does require a total rethinking of our approach to work and of our definition of our roles. So this is why it's, it's like organizational change is culture change, even though the sort of research is already kind of there. So we have a little bit of catching up to do, I think. Thank you. Anne, would you like to tackle that? Sure, that is a, a big question, and I think, um, I, I, similar to Lauren, we're finding, and I, I and, and to Jay, we're finding that the more we collaborate with one another across the libraries and with researchers and scholars and instructors on campus, the more we're, you know, distributing this knowledge, and the better these collaborations, and the more rigorous, and you know, more compelling that research. Um, and I'm also that you know, that annoying digital scholarship librarian who tells faculty that their digital projects like are really hard to preserve. Um, and the fancier they want it to be, the harder it is for us to maintain and sustain and for them to keep those things going. So maybe publish a paper to document it. And I think there's a lot of this, like this back and forth and this, um, the more that we, you know, work with our, with our, our other colleagues, the more complementary that work is. Um, and I think we're, we're finding that we engage, we bring in folks from all, you know, we have you know, digital articles that are coming out that in, included metadata librarian and our music librarian. And then we're also developing online exhibits that we work with our facilities folks in order to, you know, make them available to the public in our spaces. So there's, I think these boundaries will become very blurry and we'll end up you know, working across those, those sometimes arbitrary divisions. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. But okay. Yes, definitely. And Joe, I don't know, since you don't work directly in the library, I, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, to that. And you're welcome to pass or, or uh, chime in, whatever you'd like. Yeah, I'm not sure about... Um in the library, but I feel like there have been questions around around this, um, like how to call things, what to name it, um, isn't everything going to be digital or, you know, things like that um, for several years. And I think while we're still, you know, Anne does this as well, we sometimes ask a person or a scholar, like, you know, why a digital project? And so sometimes we get answers back that, well, maybe it doesn't need to be one. And so I think as long as there's still that kind of idea of you have like, you know, sort of more traditional methods and you have digital methods, whether you call it, you know, anything else, but there are two types of methods, I think, you know, you don't take just a, a standard, you know, term paper and copy and paste it onto a website and then ta-da, I'm doing digital scholarship. It's, there's more to it. Thank you. Great perspective. And thank you, Alan, for your comment in the chat. And finally, Jay, love to hear your perspective on this. Thanks. And I, I can echo some of Alan's um, sentiments here and, and coming from a, a science background, similarly, you know, we would just, we would just call it science. And I, I think we do that 
the, um, naturally, the more we engage with different audiences across campus, we, we modify our language or we modify the name of the program or the service in a way that um, resonates with the audience, I think. And so sometimes it's research data management, sometimes it's data visualization, sometimes it's open publishing and open access. It could be a range of different things. We don't you know, necessarily use the term digital scholarship, um, but I still think it has some value to when we're communicating with certain disciplines as well that do recognize a little bit more what that is. And, and it's that distinction is still um, very front and center for them. So, I mean, Joan, when you have that webinar for a debate on whether or not we still call it digital scholarship, I'll, I'll gladly show up and, and continue this conversation. Um, in terms of the other uh, part of your question about when will we get to the space where, um, you know, essentially all library staff have a certain competency to support this. I, I hope, Lauren, I hope you're right. I hope it's uh, sometime in, uh, you know, our tenures here. Um, and I, I see the seeds of it at our institution. And I think it really started with the number one, you need to know what types of questions are things that you can just refer straight to the, the specialists. But, you know, through those conversations, we're, 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 we're learning a bit more that there's appetite to help answer some of those questions and perhaps do it in more of a, a discipline specific context that we don't necessarily are able to do all the time and don't understand the nuances of, of specific uh, approaches. So I think there's, there's co-benefits there for sure. And I hope it, I hope it continues to progress. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to all of our presenters today. You've just been outstanding. And I hope that our participants have a lot of food for thought, some great examples some great principles to guide their work, and um, some, some new perspectives on the future directions of supporting digital scholarship, data intensive and computational research. Thank you all so very, very much. We will have a recording of this webinar online and uh, we'll have uh, likely the slides from our presenters as well. And please see the website for the project for the institutional profiles, the, um, uh, the, the presentation I made at the uh, spring CNI meeting and the first webinar. There's lots of material there and you'll soon find the overall report of the initiative there as well. So thank you again, and I wish you a, a good day. <laughs>